Hello, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. The Pituitary Network Association is a nonprofit organization that relies on the support of our members and donors. We offer this webinar series to help educate patients, their families, and their healthcare providers. During the webinar, please feel free to type in your questions at any time. Please note that all questions will be saved until the end of the webinar. We have a lot of time to answer as many questions as possible. Any questions that are not answered will be reserved and answered by email. Today's webinar is Hypopituitarism. It's presented by Dr. Lou McGollib, Endocrinology and Metabolism from the Ohio State Wexner Medical Center. Uh, the webinar will be discussing the normal pituitary gland function and physiology. Then we'll be discussing different causes of hypopituitarism and the clinical presentation of each hormonal deficiency. Then we'll try to cover some of the less common but frequently missed causes of pituitary dysfunction. Dr. Luma Gallup finished her medical school at the Baghdad University. After graduating, she moved with her husband to New Zealand where she did her initial training at Auckland Healthcare New Zealand. Dr. Gallup finished her endocrinology training in Chicago. She then worked with Mary Washington Healthcare in Virginia as a consultant endocrinologist. Dr. Gallup joined the Ohio State University in 2013, and she's been working clo closely with the neurosurgery and ENT team to create the state-of-the-art skull base and pituitary clinic. Thank you, Dr. Gallup, for offering to do this webinar for us. There's going to be a brief delay as we change presenters. Perfect. I would like to uh, welcome all the attendees that are going to be listening to this webinar. Um, as uh, Tammy said, I am Dr. Gallup, and I would like to thank the Pituitary Network Association to give me this opportunity to talk about, I think it's a very important topic for patients and families who deal with pituitary disease. As we will see uh, shortly, that it's um, it can take years for this disorder to actually show and uh, have symptoms, so it's important to keep a lot of the information in mind as you may uh, come across them during the progress of the illness. Um, so the presentation is going to be first uh, talking about what hypopituitarism is. Uh, what Dr. Gallup, I'm sorry to interrupt. I cannot see your screen. Is there something asking you to accept? Yes, I on did. Your end? Okay, you show your screen. Click on show my screen. Okay, give me one second. There you go. Can you see it? No, I see it. Yes. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect. So we're just going to start from the beginning. Um, so uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. So the objective of this presentation Perfect. So the objective of this presentation is first to define what hypopituitarism is, what's the physiology of a normal pituitary gland, how common is hypopituitarism, and what's the effect of hypopituitarism in li on life expectancy. And then we're going to move on to talk about each hormone separately, how would it present, how would people feel with this deficiency, and what treatment options are there, and how do can we monitor it. And then we're going to, in the end, we're going to leave a a few slides for a, a lot less rare but uh, important causes of hypopituitarism that can be missed. Um, so what's hypopituitarism? It's in the an inability of the pituitary gland to produce enough hormones to be adaptive with the needs of the human being. It can be only one hormone deficiency or multiple. It can The onset can be acute, very fast, or very chronic, very slow, depend on the cause of the hypopituitarism. And uh, the, it can cause either partial or full deficiency of the hormone, and it can most of the time it's caused by a disease of the pituitary itself or the hypothalamus, the gland that's controlled the pituitary gland. This is just a bit a picture of the normal pituitary gland. It's, co it's consists of the interior lobe, which is the majority of the gland, and then the posterior lobe. And the pituitary itself is connected to the rest of the brain by a small little, uh, we call a stalk, that actually have the important blood vessels. 
and um, a, a blood vessel and flow to the rest of the pituitary. And then there's the optic nerve that runs right there on top of the pituitary gland. The pituitary, the anterior pituitary, controls five hormones, and you're going to hear those five hormones along through the presentation. Um, the first one is the ACTH, adrenocorticotrophic stimulating hormone, that stimulates the adrenal glands to produce cortisol. The second one is TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, that controls the thyroid to produce T4 and T3. Gonadotropins are the sex hormones that will uh, control the ovaries and the testicles in females and males. The growth hormone is produced by the pituitary gland that uh, stimulate the liver to produce insulin-like growth factor, which is the main surrogate for growth hormone to produce its effect on the body. Prolactin is the uh, hormone that uh, control breast uh, gland secretions and lactation after delivery. Um, there is the posterior gland that produces mainly antidiuretic hormone that will touch bases once we talk about the different hormone treatment. So, uh, how common is hypopituitarism? Uh, about it's not that common. That was a lot of people don't think about it unless you are in this field. Uh, the prevalence is about 46 in 100,000. Uh, there are four cases per 100,000 a year. Um, but what's interesting is that we're noticing there's increased incidence um, of new cases. And I'm not sure if this is we're looking for more for it and we're finding it or there are more radiation surgery being uh, provided to pituitary patients and about half of the patient will have multiple hormone deficiencies. This is uh, a graph, this is specific for post-radiation, and this is the years after giving radiation to a pituitary gland. And we can see the different hormones go down on a different time interval and different frequency. Growth hormone is one of the most sensitive hormones that get affected with not just radiation, with a lot of other pituitary insults. Gonadotropins, LH and FSH will be another sensitive ones. Usually ACTH, cortisol, and thyroid hormone levels are least affected by uh, insults to the pituitary gland. Saying that, there's always exception to the rules. So what can cause hypopituitarism? The majority of cases, more than two-thirds, will be a pituitary adenoma, a tumor in the pituitary gland, the tumor itself, the radiation that's involved in treating these tumors or surgery. Other instances, there are tumors around in the area that can cause pressure and effect on the pituitary gland, like craniopharyngioma, meningioma, and less rarely chondromas. About a third of the cases are related to other causes, as apoplexy, which is a bleed inside the pituitary gland. That can happen in a pre-existing tumor in the gland that bleeds, or de novo, there are some infiltrative diseases like sarcoidosis or lymphoma or even metastasis that can uh, involve the pituitary gland. Trauma is one of the factors that can cause damage to the pituitary and decrease function. Sheehan syndrome, this is one of the things that we'll talk about later on, where there is infarct, dead death of the pituitary gland due to decreased blood supply, and there is lymphocytic, lympho, uh, lymphocytic hypophysitis when the whole pituitary gland is inflamed, is um, swollen, and can lead to def deficiency in the pituitary hormones. Unfortunately, mortality is increased in patients who do have panhypopituitarism. And it's, is, there are several studies showing that age and sex match con compared death rate to control group is actually increased in patients who do have hypopituitarism. Across the board, the, the observed versus the expected death rate is about 1.7. Unfortunately, females are more affected than males. The incidence of increased mortality in females is about double and for males about one and a half.
There are different theories why mortality is increased. Um, in the past, we used to think this is more related, and we still think it's more related to increased cardiovascular disease, but we know now there are a lot of other factors that can actually lead to increased mortality. Some of it could be under or over replacing the hormones, not replacing them in a timely fashion, and side effect of the medication, and there are a lot of other unknown factors. Important point to remember, the damage of the pituitary gland can happen in different variety, and that's why presentation can be very variable. It can happen either suddenly, or it can happen very slow over many years. It can be mild or severe, meaning not the whole pituitary is affected, partial uh, hormonal damage or complete hormonal damage, and it can affect only one hormone, several, or all of them, and that's when we call it panhypopituitarism. And these different variables can have definitely affect how the person may present with hypopituitarism, which makes it a bit challenging to the person themselves, their families, and their physician to make a correct diagnosis. So the first variable is how fast the damage happened. So if there is a sudden disease in the pituitary, as for example, apoplexy, where there is a sudden bleed in the pituitary gland, so the symptoms will happen very fast and rapid, causing decreased hormonal secretion. And so the symptoms will be fast and rapid, versus if it is due to radiation therapy, as we seen in the graph earlier, it may be very slow and may take months or even up to 10 years for the symptoms to happen. So that's very important to keep in mind, for, especially for the patient who had radiation therapy, and obviously depend on the dose, the modality of the radiation therapy, if it's gamma, gamma knife or fractionated, and the dose that's used is one to expect uh, damage to the pituitary gland. Now, the severity, um, it can, as we said, the reservation of the, of the hormone production can be partial versus complete deficiency. So, for example, for the cortisol, if the ACTH is completely deficient, the person will have severe symptoms with low blood pressure, very dizzy, very lethargic, weight loss. While just a partial deficiency, there may be no symptoms, and the little cortisol that gets secreted may be enough to get you to during the regular day uh, demands, unless there is a very stressful illness or trauma or surgery to the body, and then the symptoms start to appear with uh, uh, cortisol deficiency. So that's important to keep in mind, and that's why we ask people to have the alert bracelet, because they could be completely okay during the regular um, physical activity unless something acute happened, and so the treating physician need to know what's going on. And then the other factor is how many uh, pituitary hormones are affected. If you have only one, then you may probably have only the symptoms of that hormone deficiency. But then if you have multiple severe, then the symptoms and presentation can be very different. So that's why, uh, saying all that, it's really hard to make an assumption that uh, if you're one hormone is fine, then the others will be, or vice versa. And that's why when we do evaluate for a pituitary function, we do try to evaluate for every single hormone um, uh, function and uh, deficiency to make sure we're not missing any of the hormonal um, abnormalities. Uh, it's always there's rules, but there's a lot of exceptions to the rules with pituitary. So this is a graph just showing what's the incidence of how many hormones can be affected in across the boards. And you can you see like about 10 to 20 percent they can have only one, two, three, or all six hormone affected. The sixth one being the antidiuretic hormone from the posterior pituitary gland. So what symptoms can be uh, ongoing in addition to the hormonal deficiency? Obviously, if the person have a reason to have the pituitary damage, for example, if there is a big pituitary adenoma, then that adenoma itself can cause other symptoms beyond the, pituitary, the hormone deficiency. For example, people can have severe headache, especially people who have apoplexy can have severe sudden headache. 
Uh, visual loss, which can be either from uh, pushing on the optic chiasm, causing visual field defect that the person cannot see, usually the sides of the vision field, or people can start to see double vision if other, uh, other uh, visual nerves get affected involving the cavernous sinus. Um, other uh, uh, symptoms, um, people can have altered smell of, sen uh, of sense of smell, and we see that usually more common after surgery, especially if they have the transphenoidal approach. So this is just an MRI of one of the patients. Um, just this is a coronal view. So the eyes are in the front. This is going back. Uh, this is the rest of the brain. This is the vault of the skull. And the pituitary gland normally is a small pea-sized uh, lesion, uh, sorry, small pea-sized uh, structure that attached to the rest of the brain with the stock. In this case, this pituitary is enlarged by a pituitary adenoma, and you can see it's slightly asymmetrical, more to the right. The pituitary stalk is very pushed upward. This is the optic nerve, where the vision nerve from the eye going to the back of the brain, and we can see in this case the tumor is very close to the optic nerve. The structures on the side of the pituitary we call the cavernous sinus, where the carotid arteries are supplying the blood supply to the brain, and there is a lot of small nerves uh, that run around in the cavernous sinus. And sometimes the tumor either extends superiorly or upward, affecting the optic nerve, or can extend to the sides, invading the cavernous sinus. And each of these can give different uh, symptoms uh, beyond the hormonal deficiency. So what are the clinical presentation of different hormones? Um, so to make it simple, I try to focus on each hormone by itself, but in reality, really, people present with a mixture of, of different hormones, as we did see with the graph. Most of people have more than one hormone at a time. Um, so, but I'll just try to simplify things is to focus on each one and what we're trying to look for. So again, cortisol, each hormone I have a small little um, favorite spot for it. So the cortisol is actually the hardest of all to evaluate, to treat, and to monitor after treatment. But at the same time, it's the most important of all the pituitary hormones. It can be life-threatening if this hormone deficiency is missed. So let's talk about what's cortisol. So this is the hormone that's produced from the adrenal gland in stimulation by ACTH that comes from the pituitary. So we call it the pituitary adrenal access. In the most severe form, if there is no cortisol production, then people can have really shock, collapse, and death. And this is because the blood vessels collapse, there's not enough blood pressure to support the system. In less severe cases, it can be uh, uh, postural hypotension, which is dizziness, especially if you stand up all of a sudden, uh, heart racing during that episode, and less mild, more slower presentation. People can be very, very vague symptoms, including just feeling tired, not feeling up to eating, losing weight, decreased sexual interest, and at times in severe cases, low sugar reaction. So it's very important to realize that mild cases can be have very few symptoms or nothing at all unless there is an Ill, acute illness that can bring it to the surface. Now treatment, well, it's impossible to really replace physiologically exactly what our adrenal gland. Our adrenal change the cortisol level from minute to minute hour to hour, from day to night, depend on what our body needs. So it will be really hard to mimic that by medications. But we try our best to give the most physiological dose, the most physiological variation during the night and day. The, re the recent recommendation is actually to use hydrocortisol, which is shorter half-life and similar to the physiological, our own hydrocortisol, as compared to prednisone or dexamethasone, which are the other treatment used to treat, to treat adrenal insufficiency. Um, so there's no simple, once the treatment is started, there's no simple test really for us as the physician to evaluate the adequacy of the treatment. We depend a lot on the patients to tell us how they feel, 
what's their blood pressure, how they look on exam. We look for swelling in the ankles, which is signs of over-treatment. We check sodium, potassium. Sometimes they can guide us with treatment, but really there is no simple blood test. I always remind my patient who have adrenal insufficiency to to increase their dose with an acute illness, and sometimes we need to admit them to the hospital to give them IV hydrocortisol. It is a very critical illness. We call it the sick day rule, and we ask people to wear an alert bracelet just in case for emergency that other treating physician may not know what's going on. So unlike, so there's one caveat in a pituitary cause of adrenal insufficiency that's different from what we call primary adrenal insufficiency when the adrenal gland itself rather than the pituitary is affected. That's what's called Edison disease. And then I'll have a lot of people who search the internet and they come in and tell me, well, Edison was supposed to do this and that. So Edison is a, a term that refers to a primary adrenal deficiency. The adrenal gland itself is gone versus um, pituitary cause of adrenal insufficiency, the adrenal gland still have some function because the adrenal gland itself is not damaged. It's just the control with ACTH that's gone. So people with Edison disease need more hormones like uh, mineralocorticoid, like Florinef, as compared to pituitary patients who usually do not need Florinef unless very special cases. So the second hormone is my, the e, I always call it, is the easiest hormone to evaluate, to look for, especially if you know what you're looking for with a couple of caveats. So this is a picture for a severe hypothyroid patient um, and almost like having a myxedema as a coma. Well, there's a lot of puffiness around the eyes, there's dry skin, weight gain, um, cold intolerance, severe constipation, and fatigue. But the symptoms are not always like that, and if you have a mild condition, you may not have any symptoms. Um, the, um, usually, uh, the symptoms are progressive and slow, and it take months for, or years for it to be full uh, asymptomatic. Uh, the replacement is simple. We usually treat with um, thyroid replacement. Um, there are a couple of caveats that we need to pay attention if we're dealing with a person who have what we call secondary hypothyroidism, meaning uh, pituitary cause of their thyroid damage versus primary hypothyroidism, which is the most common cause of hypothyroidism in the general population. So the two caveat is we do not start thyroid replacement until we check the cortisol level because we can really get into trouble if we replace thyroid before cortisol. So that's one caveat. The second caveat, uh, we've been always told, and doctors will always use check TSH as the marker for thyroid uh, diagnosis and treatment. For pituitary causes, that's not enough. We usually follow the T4 more than the TSH to guide our treatment uh, targets. Now, the gonadotropins, these are the sex hormones, and they are different in males and females. So this is the third hormone. So in females, the symptoms can be very different depend on the age of the, of the person. So in young females who are premenopausal, um, and if they're all of a sudden their estrogen progesterone decrease, secretion decrease, then they can have a regular period and, or no period, what we call amenorrhea. They can have infertility, they can have local vaginal atrophy, they can have hot flashes, and for after many years they can start having decreased bone mineral density with osteopenia or osteoporosis. In men, uh, testicular hypofunction can lead to decreased testosterone secretion and sperm production. So young men can present with infertility, they can have decreased energy uh, level and decreased sexual drive. In severe cases, men can have hot flashes too. And then again, after several years, they can have decreased bone density and decreased muscle strength. Now treatment, again, will be very different, depend on the sex of the other person. If they do want to get um, uh, kids, if the fertility is desired or not, and the age of the individual. So let's talk about females. For young females who are not interested in fertility, then the recommendation is actually to replace both estrogen and progesterone. Um, it won't be like, a, like when we replace 
uh, postmenopausal women, this is actually not considered just a type of HRT treatment. This is they're replacing their physiological hormones that's missing by the pituitary damage. For females who desire fertility, then usually they need to see a fertility specialist to in, uh, in induction for ovulation and maintenance of pregnancy, which is be a lot more involved treatment. Uh, for postmenopausal women who are already went through menopause and then they have a pituitary damage, then their hormone replacement will be just sort of like the general population. We need to sit down, talk about risk, benefit, how bad their symptoms are, what's the risk of uh, ongoing hormone replacement for postmenopausal women. For men, again, age is different and depend on the desired fertility or not. So for, for, for men's whose fertility is not an, an option, then usually replace with testosterone replacement therapy and that can be uh, topical gel preparations or injectable medications or implants. Uh, for men who fertility is an important factor, then um, usually see an, an infertility special, specialist and be treated with like Clomid or a GNRH injectable medication to restore their uh, gonadal access and improve their sperm production. Now the fourth hormone is the growth hormone. This is, is one of the most controversial replacement treatment. I'm, not go I'm going to talk a little about the controversy, but I'm not going to go into details unless one of the audience have more specific questions. So the growth hormone in, in children, it's very obvious. It's, if deficiency can lead to short stature, a lot of complications, and definitely need to be replaced. For adults, if you have a growth hormone deficiency onset in adulthood, then it does have multiple uh, factors and effect on the body. It can increase fat, fat mass, decrease muscle mass, it can decrease bone density in men and possibly in women after years of growth hormone deficiency. It has a negative effect on lipid profile, increasing LDL. And it can have some negative effect on the cardiovascular disease. Uh, there's a lot of research about how causing endothelial dysfunction and problems in um, the health of the cardiovascular system. And overall, when they test people off just generally well-being, they don't do as well as general population. So there are several preparations available now. It's subcutaneous, subcutaneous daily injection. It is a bit of an expensive medication compared to the other hormone replacement. And there is a lot of controversy about the effect of growth hormone replacement in adult onset growth hormone deficiency. So we know it may increase um, um, muscle mass, it decreased fat, it may have some lipid uh, benefit, but there are a lot of conflicting data coming out. Uh, for the bone density, we know it may help men, but unfortunately not women. There was an interesting study where they studied a big group of patients on about more than two years of hormone, growth hormone replacement therapy, and mortality rate unfortunately did not improve with growth hormone treatment. The most common side effect of growth hormone treatment uh, is edema, joint problems, carpal tunnel, some numbness, and some worsening in glucose level and increasing insulin resistance. So what the endocrine society say, just, interval, just talk to your patient individual treatment depend on their symptoms, what's going on, what's their expectations, and evaluating the risk and benefit on each case by itself. The fifth hormone is prolactin. I think we really don't know a lot about this hormone. For now, we know its main effect is on breast uh, milk and lactation, and we really do not have any treatment replacement for this uh, uh, hormone. This is the sixth one, so this is the antidiuretic hormone. It's actually produced from the hypothalamus, uh, uh, that's the small gland that sits on top of the pituitary, and it is stored in the pituitary and get released from the pituitary. The main function of this hormone is our ability to concentrate the urine. 
So if you have deficiency in this hormone, you won't be able to concentrate the urine and end up producing a lot of very diluted urine. And that will result in frequent urination. The most bother them is at nighttime, and people we keep up awaking all night to go to the bathroom, and then they will feel very thirsty trying to replace all the fluid loss. Uh, the treatment available are subcutaneous, and we usually use that in emergencies and at an acute post-operative setting as subcutaneous injections, and the most too common uh, preparation, we use nasal sprays and oral pills. We start with a nighttime dosing to help with the nighttime urination, and then if the person needs more than one dose, then they, we can start uh, multiple doses during the day. To evaluate the treatment is really very important to get good communication with a person who's suffering from this illness. Um, how often are you, they have to urinate, how often uh, they need to wake up at nighttime. We do do urine testing to check how concentrated the urine is. We do check sodium, but really what um, our patient tell us is very important to adjust the medication need for this hormone. And I just want to mention, this is very different than diabetes mellitus, which is, again, will have frequent urination. But the diabetes mellitus, DM for short, is a lot more common, and it's caused by high sugar in the urine. This is a lot less common. It's called DI, diabetes insipidus. And they will have frequent urination, but because of the urine, is very diluted. Now, so this is, we went over most of the hormones that can go uh, wrong. We talked about all five of them, and we talked about each one of them, how would they present, and what's the treatment. Now, in reality, we really don't get it divided like that. A person comes in, they have a, a lot of uh, complaints, a lot of symptoms, they feel tired, and then we start to work one by one and try to eliminate and do several testing. Sometimes we need to do dynamic testing to figure out uh, which hormonal is deficient and when do we need to replace and how. So I'm going to move on to uh, less common causes of hypopituitarism. So this is when um, there are damage to the pituitary, but it is not caused by a, a, a pituitary adenoma or craniopharyngioma or bleed in the pituitary. This is um, a, a traumatic brain injury has come uh, into light recently uh, due to media coverage for sport injuries, for combat um, coming back from wars, and having uh, some um, uh, hormonal deficiencies. So in the full-blown picture, if somebody have a severe trauma causing a fracture in the, the base of the skull, causing direct damage to the hypothalamus and the pituitary, then definitely they can have high risk of having pituitary damage. But the more recent light that's shedding on this case is with more blunt trauma. Uh, that can cause disturbance in the pituitary function without causing fracture in the skull base. And hypopituitarism, um, obviously, it's the, the harder the trauma, the more severe the trauma, then the chances of having some pituitary function damage are higher than if there is a mild or moderate trauma. The caveat in this case is when to evaluate patients and when, uh, when to replace the hormone replacement. So for people who are having acute illness, acute brain injury, then if we start checking their pituitary hormones, more than two-thirds of them, they may have some hormonal alteration. If we wait for three months, then the incidence drop. If we wait for a whole year, so will less people will still have some pituitary deficiency. And a lot of people, why is that? For the acute illness, when a person is in the ICU with a severe critical brain trauma, a lot of the hormonal testing on the blood test will look abnormal. And we see that a lot in any ICU patient. It doesn't have to have a brain trauma. ICU patient with acute illness, when we check their thyroid levels, they can be abnormal. We call it U-thyroid 6 syndrome. And that's just the body trying to adjust the hormone levels due to the acute illness. And most of the cases will not end up with long-term pituitary damage. 
knowledge. So that needs to be put in prospect when we're evaluating for pituitary function in an acute illness. Now with time, the three months and the year evaluation, we think there is a possibility that the pituitary function actually recovers, some of it recover and improve. And so we have to be careful when to test and who to test and then even if we start treatment, we need to monitor for possible recovery of some of these pituitary function. Now we're going to move on to an even less common condition but can be very easily missed for months or years. So Sheehan syndrome is a condition that used to be common in the past. Now in, the, in, in our country, in a lot of developed country, this is very rare now due to improvement in obstetric care. So what is Sheehan syndrome? So during labor and postpartum, when there is a severe hemorrhage in the pituitary, sorry, in the postpartum hemorrhage, vaginal hemorrhage, then the blood pressure goes down. There is an infarct in the pituitary gland where the pituitary actually have relative low blood supply and the function of the pituitary goes down. In underdeveloped countries, this is still a common cause of pituitary damage, unfortunately. And um, the pituitary gland itself have a special uh, sensitivity to be damaged during labor and postpartum for uh, this is a cartoon that shows it during labor, well first, during pregnancy, the pituitary gland itself is actually larger than when a, when a person is not pregnant because of all the hormonal, increased hormonal demand during pregnancy. Now combining an enlarged pituitary gland already with a, a bleed and low blood pressure and during pregnancy and delivery time, there is some problems with clotting, the bleeding, and there are issues with blood flow. So combining all these factors during labor and after labor with decreased blood supply, problem with clotting, and an already enlarged pituitary gland that needed decreased demand of blood, that relative decrease in blood supply to the pituitary gland can lead to what we call infarct there's necrosis, there's death in the pituitary gland, and that can affect uh, a lot of the pituitary function. Now, how can you usually present? It depends, again, the same rules, which hormones are affected and how fast it's get affected and this degree of the pituitary damage. So in severe cases, uh, the woman can present with feeling very tired, lethargic, unable to breastfeed her baby, and can present within a few weeks. In moderate cases, again, after delivery, the woman will still feel tired, fatigued, start to lose weight, start to lose some of the sexual hair and decrease sexual function. In very mild cases, this can go on for years and it's not uh, picked up. Um, can it just be very vague, tiredness, uh, aging and premature aging, just not feeling well uh, overall. And there was some uh, a study from Turkey that shows the median age for the diagnosis to be accurately done. It took almost 26 years, which is scary and you think how many cases are missed in these countries. Now again, with Sheehan syndrome, it depends on if there is um, a total uh, infarct in the pituitary, and if there is an infarct, then a partial empty cella will be the main presenting uh, finding on the MRI. Uh, you need about more than half of the pituitary function to be destroyed for a clinical uh, picture actually to present uh, for uh, the syndrome. And the most common, again, the same thing. The gonad, the sex hormone, the prolactin, and the growth hormones are the earlier to go uh, down. The thyroid and the cortisol are usually preserved, but there's always um, um, exception to the rules. And DI, which we've talked about, it comes from the uh, on the uh, thalamus, usually is not affected with Sheehan uh, because the thalamus uh, part of the brain is usually not affected with Sheehan syndrome.
So this is just another MRI and this is a sagittal view. So this is the rest of the brain there. The eyes are over here, that's the nose. And the pituitary gland usually is round and plumb and a pea size. And that's the stalk that's connected to the rest of the brain. That's the hypothalamus and that's the optic nerve, the eye nerve going to the eye. So in the cases of Sheehan syndrome or other causes of empty cell, if the gland is disease and it's um, becoming atrophy, uh, there you see it's all squished to the side, leaving the rest of the cell empty, and that's where the name comes, partial empty or full empty cell syndrome. So I think I'm going to stop here uh, and uh, open the floor for any questions or any comments or um, that I can answer. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about uh, hypopetridism. Thank you, Dr. Gallum. That was excellent. We do have several questions. We'll get to as many as we can. Uh, the first question, being that I have been without a pituitary gland for coming up on 30 years now and have been taking replacement medication, what, if anything, happens on the days when I forget to take my replacement steroid? This often happens, not by choice, but it does. Is this affecting my body? This is not the only medication I take, but it is obviously the most important. I would have to agree it is the most important of the all of the hormones and it's the one that you really going to need on daily basis each time you're missing any of these tablets you're putting on your your stress on your body that have to deal with the daily demand without cortisol our own adrenal gland will never do that to us uh, so I would say it is important I would say take it right away when you remember we do not recommend to double the next day because you may end up with having high levels and then low levels, but we really want to take every opportunity to take the medications on time and not to miss them. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question uh, has a little bit of a preview first. Male 51, hemochromatosis. hemochromatosis. Uh -huh. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> T2 star MRI using both side echo and turbo modes concluded abnormal signaling of the pituitary with deposits on the stock and the pituitary itself. Two glucocon provocative and a GCMS 24-hour urine conclude growth hormone deficiency. Question, what can be done to rid the pituitary of the deposits and reinstate proper signaling? So hemochromatosis is a very rare disease that's genetic, so it runs in families, where they have problem with dealing with the iron storage. Um, so um, there will be iron deposit in different part of the body. And unfortunately, the pituitary and the brain is one of them. Uh, it can actually cause a testicular problem where the iron deposit can happen in the testicles too. And it can happen in a lot of other parts of the, of the body. Uh, so these extra iron storage can damage the, the structure of whatever organ it's involved. Um, the treatment usually, um, and again, I'm not a hematologist, but usually treatment is phlebotomy where they actually get them to do blood uh, to donate blood or give blood to decrease the blood levels and there are some chelating agents but again don't I'm not the specialist in this case but once the damage that can happen in the pituitary itself we start replacing the, the hormones and it can be any like any other pituitary damage you need to evaluate all the hormones and whatever is deficient to replace now if you do have adult onset growth hormone deficiency then that goes into that category of controversy. You sit out with your endocrinologist, talk about risk and benefit, and what would you, what would that be the way you want to go? Uh, I would, if you haven't had um, other hormone evaluation, uh, definitely need to be done. Uh, as, as far as we know, hemochromatosis really can cause other hormone damage, and the sex hormones will be the, the main ones that go down in addition to the other ones. Okay, thank you. Uh, my two sisters and I have all had pituitary anomas. Does it run in families? 
Oh, that's an excellent question. We didn't go there, but that's, so the majority of pituitary adenomas are what we call sporadic, meaning they just happen just to that person. But there are some genetic predisposition for certain syndrome that multiple family members can have a pituitary or a lot of times they can have other neuroendocrine tumors. So there is the MEN1, when um, multiple family member, if there's the gene defect, they can have pituitary tumors in addition to parathyroid or uh, pancreatic tumors that can produce hormones. Um, there are PIT1 mutation where there's the mutation in certain genetics that can predispose multiple families uh, to have uh, tumors. So if you haven't had genetic testing, that will be very highly recommended to do genetic testing to look into why multiple family members. Now the other question that I get asked is, uh, do we need to do genetic testing for every person who has pituitary adenoma? Um, usually the answer is no. As I said, the majority of cases are sporadic. That's the only family member. But if we do get a history. So if there are multiple family members have pituitary or other neuroendocrine tumors, then we do send them actually to our genetic counseling to discuss the case further and send them for genetic testing. Very interesting. Uh, can you please explain what the 1.7% decrease in life expectancy really means? Let's say for a male the actuarial life expectancy is 88 years old. By how many years would this be reduced given the data that you reported? Yeah, um, this is a bit hard to do the calculation. It's not really by by years, but it is the chances for a person to have uh, to increase mortality. Let's say if mortality increased by two, means there's two twice likely a person may actually die as compared to the general population. So it's really hard to do give a number for the exact age, and we know females are have higher mortality. Really there's not enough studies to explain the gender difference between males and females, but we do know there is increased mortality. And in the past we used to blame it on people are not on the right treatment, not getting diagnosed early, and, and or, or maybe even over replacement and causing too much hormone levels in the body, which can be harmful. We know now it's even more complicated than that, so even people who've been on the right treatment, they still have increased mortality, and it would be really naive to, to think taking two hydrocortisol a day is enough to replace our really meticulously controlled adrenal uh, pituitary access. So we know there is more to the story and there's a lot more um, a, a, a hormonal effect than just what we think. Thank you. Uh, what is your opinion of cortisol pumps? My doctor uses low-dose dexamethasone and doesn't support the pump idea, but the arguments coming out of England about more physiological delivery seem convincing. So that's actually very good timing for this question because it's related to the previous one. Right. So, the, so the, yeah, <laughs> perfect timing. So the, there are, for now, the mainstream treatment for cortisol treatment are hydrocortisol, which is have the shortest half-life, and we usually we give it in two or three divided doses, the morning being the highest and afternoon being the lowest. Try to mimic our own circadian rhythm, which is high at dawn time, lowest at midnight. Um, other replacement is the theory behind them. They have longer half-life like dexamethasone or um, prednisone, so it will be easier for the person to take and not forget taking multiple medications. The new Endocrine Society guideline actually supports using hydrocortisol rather than the long-acting, assuming the person does not miss their pills as our first uh, um, um, we want to ask the first question. Uh, so the, the idea behind that is trying to mimic our own physiology. But we know, as I said earlier, we're definitely not doing a, a perfect job of mimicking our own exact um, physiology. So having a pump will give us more the leisure of giving different doses, but it will not overcome, let's say, if I'm driving and I got very upset while I'm driving, my own cortisol level will go up to get me through whatever happened. The pump will not be able to do that, so still we're trying to 
be closer to physiology if we want to be it won't be perfect. Just using insulin pump uh, for diabetic patients. So we try to get closer to what our pancreas was doing, but not perfect. So the same thing with uh, hydrocortisol pumps. We'll need more input, a lot more control from the physicians, and more education, uh, more gadgets, more supply. But if you if you have a, a physician who's willing to work with you, it may not be a bad option. Excellent. Okay. Do you have any thoughts about timing of growth hormone during the day? I've seen studies showing a split dose morning and evening could produce good results with a total lower dose, but when I take it in the morning, I seem to feel awful, very blue and low energy. Any experience, thoughts? So uh, um, to, to answer this question, growth hormone normally physiologically secreted the highest is when we're sleeping. So the recommendation to give the growth hormone injections at nighttime, and remember this is a shot, so um, you just have to think about what extra advantage of doing smaller, higher dose of growth hormone during the day. The recommendation is actually to use it only once a day and preferably at nighttime to try to mimic physiology. Okay, thank you. What happens when you have too much ACTH? So it depends on the question, is this a, a, a native too much ACTH? So remember, ACTH is the hormone that comes from the pituitary that control our adrenal gland. So the production normally in physiology in, in uh, people who do not have pituitary damage, they have very variable levels of ACTH. It depends on the time of the day and what's happening, if you're sick, if you're relaxed. So the levels can be anywhere. Um, persistently high ACTH start just to make think about is there some problem there like Cushing syndrome which is a tumor in the pituitary gland that's overproduced to ACTH that's overestimate the adrenal gland that's caused a, a clinical condition of too much cortisol that we call Cushing disease but if it's just a one-time high ACTH on a blood test that really doesn't mean much depend on what's happening in the body at that time so it's not diagnostic of any condition unless it's supported by other testing Okay. Is there any relationship between exposure to DES in utero and hypopituitarism? Actually, I have panhypopituitarism. I have an almost non-existent pituitary, which was discovered at age 18. Oh, that's a hard question. I'm really not, I know DEHs have a lot of effect on the gonads, on the ovaries and testicles and the sex hormones, but I'm not aware of any studies specifically about the pituitary damage. I mean, theoretically it may, but I'm really not sure if there is anything, and especially now there's not much of exposure, so it's in the past, um, so it would be, I really cannot, I don't know if there is any uh, definite causality uh, confirmed in, in studies. Okay. What is the best way to determine cortisol level? I take hydrocortisone at a replacement dose. Yeah, I remember when I said about hydrocortisol and about the adrenal, this is the hardest of all. Each one of the hormones, I have a special space in my heart for them, and cortisol is the toughest of all of them. Uh, so remember what we said, once you're on treatment, there is really no simple test that can be done to evaluate if you are on the right dose. Some will suggest to check ACTH to make sure it's not suppressed, some will check the 24-hour cortisol, checking a hydrocortisol level. None of them have been supported by studies as a good measure to check if you are on the right dose. Having a good physician and a good communication will be the best thing to try to figure out if you are on the right dose. Have the level of energy, your blood pressure, your weight, if you're starting to have osteoporosis, if you start to have weight gain or weight loss, swelling in the ankles, sodium, potassium, all these are indirect ways to check the levels uh, if you are on the right dose. In the past, we think that we used to over-treat people a bit. The recommendation was 20 and 10 milligram of hydrocortisone, almost everybody. We know now that's probably supraphysiological and we're striving to try to 
cut down as little and as safe as possible and uh, try to figure if they can tolerate lower doses. And you and your physician will know if this is not the right dose for you. Okay. Uh, can you talk about anxiety, depression, or pituitary apathy and recommend treatment medications that will not negatively impact hormones? Oh, that's uh, the hardest questions of all. We know uh, panhypopitch or pituitary deficiency, different hormones can lead really to a lot of stresses on the body. And the study after study, when they checked for the overall well-being of a patient with pituitary illness, not just hypopit, even when there's overscreeching of some of the pituitary function, acromegaly and Cushing, and we know there is a lot of stresses on the body. And they do suffer from more depression, anxiety, and other uh, uh, issues, sleep disturbances, weight problems. Um, there is no one specific medication that's better than the others. We always try to prefer the lowest doses that can work or non-medical, non-pharmacological support system that a person can use and being on the right treatment. If you are over-treated with cortisol, that definitely can make you more anxious and depressed. The same thing, if you're under-treated with thyroid, you can be depressed. If you're over-treated, you're going to have insomnia, anxiety, and all that. So uh, working close, uh, closely with your endocrinologist and probably a counselor to try to figure what's the best treatment. Okay, thank you. What's the role of nutrition and diet during the hypopituitarism therapy? Um, there was really no specific diet. A lot of people say, what can I do, what can I eat that will make my pituitary be better? Um, the same thing what I tell my thyroid, my pituitary patient. Um, there's, as far as we know, there's little that we can do that alter what has already happened. But uh, pituitary patients do have um, extra stresses on their body and extra challenges that uh, people with healthy pituitary may have. So we know overweight, obesity, and metabolic syndrome is common in the general population, but it will be even more uh, important to eat low-carb, well-balanced diet, high fibers, high fruit, high vegetable diet to try to overcome all the hormonal imbalances. So for example, uh, hypothyroid, if, you do, if you're slightly under-treated, you're going to be a lot of higher risk of gaining weight. Growth hormone, if you are on treatment of growth hormone, this growth hormone treatment increase your insulin resistance, so you'll become high risk of having diabetes not being treated while you have growth hormone deficiency. We know you have a negative impact on your, meta on your lipid profile and you have increased risk of fat accumulation. So it's not an easy um, decision, uh, but people who do have pituitary function, modifying their diet and even lifestyle exercise, if you're healthy enough to add to the other treatment that your physicians are providing you to get as healthy as possible. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see. If we are diagnosed with hypopituitarism, how do we know we are being treated correctly by our endocrinologist? I am being treated, but I have symptoms for diabetes insipidus, and he never checks for it. I had a tumor when I was pregnant in 1986. It was removed via craniotomy, then radiation after I had my daughter. I was on growth hormone, but have had stage four melanoma, so they took me off, and he never checks anything except thyroid. I live in Maine now from California. Oh, well, that's, a, uh, that's actually a very important case. So you did have surgery, you did have radiation, so you're full in that category that you may still, although it's been many years ago, I would, if you were my patient, I probably would check. It, 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 you remember, this is many years, so we can't keep checking hormones every every visit or every month or every three months. So in the beginning, I check it more frequent, and the further away we're from the insult we are, we start to check less often, but we still check yearly or every other year, depending on what's going on, especially if you're on treatment, you're going to be having still uh, checkup frequently. Um, I would definitely discuss that if you do have symptoms um, of some of the what we mentioned. Remember, a lot of them can be very subtle and may take years for it to happen. Happen. Uh, so you do need to be checked for uh, for the other pituitary hormones and uh, be evaluated. Now you're empowered to know each hormone, what symptoms it can cause. The problem 
with hypoperfusion though, even if you are on the right treatment, what we talked about, people do not feel back to normal. And I that's remember I said we there's a lot of factors we don't know about, and that's my explanation is why we people just never feel right, even if they are all their numbers are perfect, all the hormones are being checked. It's just the well-being never goes back to where it should be hundred percent. And I think that's due to the minor changes in our normal, healthy, physiological fine-tuning of our hormone versus our best of doing the medication the way how we do it. And there, I think there are a lot of other small factors that we don't really know about. Okay. Um, can hormone deficiency lead to back osteoarthritis or any type of back pain such as facet joint syndrome? Um, it depends on what, what deficiency. So we know for the gonads, for uh, low testosterone and low estrogen level, we know for the growth hormone, if it's not replaced, it can cause um, decrease in bone density. Uh, usually osteoporosis per se itself, if it's not causing fracture, should not cause a lot of pains and aches. But if there are some uh, minor vertebral compression fractures that not detected, that can cause back pain and problems. So yes, theoretically, it may have some effect on um, the, the back problems. And one question is about the growth hormone and cancer. That's related to the previous question. I'm sorry, I missed it. So there is a lot of controversy about treatment with growth hormone and regrowth of the pituitary adenoma itself or inducing other malignancies in the body. And that's, remember what growth hormone I said, it's the, the acronym of growth hormone is the more controversial hormone of all. So that's the issue with growth hormone replacement and effect on growth of malignancy. So for the adenoma itself, there are several studies. And as far as we know, treatment with growth hormone would not increase the recurrence rate of the pituitary adenoma itself. Now, for other malignancy, it's a bit more murky, and the studies have been very conflicting. Um, there are some studies showing that a growth hormone may induce other malignancy growth, um, especially we know that from people who have too much growth hormone, like acromegaly, they do have increased colonic polyps, they are increased other. So, so this is one of the controversial uh, topics with growth hormone. Okay. I'm going to do one or two more questions. Uh, I have a tumor on my pituitary and have sur had surgery three times to remove it. Unfortunately, there is still some on the artery which is unable to be surgically removed. Uh, what are your experiences with gamma knife treatment? And then the same person also commented, have also had adrenals removed. So if I want to guess, you probably had Cushing syndrome. That's why they had to remove the adrenal to uh, to decrease the effect of Cushing on the adrenal glands. Uh, so this is a very tough scenario, and we actually deal with that because our center we we see people who with repeat surgeries and come for second opinions. So. Um, Unfortunately, remember that picture that I showed when the tumor invade the lateral, the, the sides of the glands, and that's what we call the cavernous sinus. So once the tumor invade the cavernous sinus, then it's become really hard for the surgeon to go between the blood vessels and try to remove most of that tumor. So the cure rate, once the tumor involved the cavernous sinus, go way down. And it depends on the rate of the growth and what type of uh, growth that's happening. So if it's a non-functioning, slow-growing adenoma, even if there is a small uh, lesion left in the cavernous sinus, we monitor it. If the tumor is more aggressive, and again, not all pituitary adenomas are the same. There are some more aggressive than others. Then, and we see it regrowing, and we know the surgeon will not be able to offer more. We may elect to do the gamma knife. So the deal with the gamma knife, it will not work right away. It may take months or years for it to work, but it can in, it go through the other tissues that the surgeon cannot reach with surgery. So that's the advantage of it. The disadvantage, the gamma knife itself or 
the old way of the fractionated radiation therapy can damage the pituitary function. So if a person have a still normal full pituitary gland that's functioning, we think twice before we send them to radiation. If a person already have panhypopit, then, then, then there's little less to lose uh, with, the, with the radiation. Now the other factors that we're now seeing years after the radiation, the more exposure to the blood vessels around, now we're noticing there is something that the radiation itself may increase the what we call atherosclerosis, mean hardening of the blood vessels and risk of stroke. So it's a really hard balance to decide who gets the radiation and how many treatment they get and what field of radiation. Obviously with the gamma knife have the advantage that we're treatment will be very focused to the area that's needed. So if you already have three surgeries, you already had adrenectomy, then you don't have really a lot of other options. Giving you medical therapy will help with the hormones, but it will not help with the regrowth of the, the tumor. So maybe radiation will be an option for you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I had a small pituitary tumor removed in 2004 that proved to be scar tissue when pathology was done. I am panhypopit but was before surgery as well and have secondary adrenal insufficiency. Now they think I have Schmidt syndrome and possibly misothenia gravis. Can you speak to autoimmune causes of pituitary failure and how treatment might differ if it is due to autoimmune issues? Wow. That's a very interesting case. So what I would think with the scar tissue that's found, and you already had pine hypopitch before the surgery, most probably what you had is uh, the lymphocytic hypophysitis, which is um, a condition that the whole pituitary gland get inflamed, swollen. It used to happen a lot around pregnancy, and we used to call it postpartum uh, hypophysitis. Now we're seeing more and more cases off it the more we look. Um, so the whole gland get inflamed, fibrose, and end up with just a big scar. Um, so autoimmune diseases are autoimmune diseases. When our own body starting attacking our part of our body thinking it's foreign. So people can have Hashimoto thyroiditis, colitis, ulcerative colitis, type 1 diabetes. So uh, once a person have one autoimmune disease, they are considered having another auto high risk of another autoimmune disease, like the mycemia gravis that you're having. So obviously you do have autoimmune diseases. Would the treatment be specifically different if you have hypophysitis as compared to other type of hypopituitism? Sort of yes. In the early stages, remember when we said with hypopituitism that the cortisol is the last one to get affected? Not in hypophysitis. We're seeing cases, especially with the newer medication-induced hypophysitis, some chemo-induced hypophysitis, is the cortisol will be the earliest one to get down. So um, in your case, you already pan hypopit, and the treatment replacement treatment will be the same. But if somebody who's having acute case of hypophysitis, you have to be very careful with the cortisol level because it goes down early on. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have quite a few more questions, but I think I'm going to do one more because uh, we're going over our time here. Uh, I have an ACTH deficiency. I was diagnosed over time by the fact that I passed the corticotropin stimulation test but failed the insulin tolerant test. Many doctors do not understand that these are two different tests and feel that the ACTH stimulation test and the ITT test should not contradict each other. Can you please comment? Wow, that's a very good in-depth question. So this is another level, and I didn't go there. I was thinking when somebody will ask me about this question, but it gets very complicated and confusing to people. But I'll try to make it as simple for the benefit of all the other audience. So the, the, when we suspect ACTH adrenal axis damage, the simple test is what we call the concentropin stim test. So what we do, we give the person, we get a baseline cortisol, we give them a shot of synthetic ACTH and see if the adrenal glands will wake up. So a person who had severe long-term uh, adrenal and uh, pituitary damage, the adrenal will not wake up because they've been atrophied from long-term not being stimulated with ACTH. So they fail this test. Um, but a person who had acute or partial 
pituitary damage, the adrenal are not completely atrophy. They're still functioning. So when we stimulate them with extra ACTH, they will wake up and they will give us what we call false positive, false negative test. It means they pass the test, but they may have still a partial pituitary damage uh, that we're overcoming by giving ACTH. I know that's a bit confusing, but it, it, yes, there are a few cases that you can have normal cosotropin stem test and you still can have a pituitary damage. And the hypoglycemia is the what we call gold standard, meaning it's more accurate than the cosotropin. The problem with hypoglycemia, not a lot of sensors do it because they worry about hypoglycemia and the risk of hypoglycemia. So yes, there are cases where mild partial uh, ACDH deficiency can have uh, discordance between these two tests. Okay, thank you and change my mind. I'm going to ask one more question. <laughs> <laughs> Is a four millimeter microadenoma a problem? The doctors don't seem to think so, yet my adrenals don't work and I have doubled in weight from fluid and swelling, which started in my ankles. I'm now swollen all over and have other symptoms, tachycardia, enlarged heart fluid, etc. Thanks. So when I see a person with a pituitary tumor, there are three questions that we have to answer. First, is this tumor big enough that's obstructing the optic nerve or the cavernous sinus? Uh, so obviously in your case, this is not the case because the tumor is very small. So the second question, is this tumor overproducing hormone? So if the tumor is overproducing, like too much growth hormone, too much cortisol, then the size really doesn't matter. What, even if the tumor is very small, but if it is what we call hyperfunctioning tumor, then it needs to come out, need to, then it needs to have to be treated. So size will not be the only indication for surgery. Um, so that's in your case. I will have the very thorough investigation of Cushing, which is too much cortisol that can cause swelling and weight gain and all that, and or acromegaly, which is too much growth hormone. And if you do have any of these conditions, then surgery will be a treatment option regardless to the size. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, very informative. There are a lot more questions that we did not get to. If you don't mind possibly answering them by email, we can get to all of them that way. Uh, we are running quite over our time here, so uh, the amount of questions we still have could probably fill another 20 minutes or so. Um, I will try to answer with Dr. Gallup's help as many questions as possible. Uh, we have a lot of thank yous for you as well, and I, as well as others, have learned quite a bit. We really appreciate it. Uh, this You're will. Most welcome. Well, thank you for inviting me. I actually enjoyed it too. <laughs> oh, good, good. Um, like I said, we'll get everything, as many things as we can, answered by email. This concludes our webinar presentation. If we did not get a chance to answer your questions, we'll be answering them via email. PNA wishes to thank you for participating in our webinar. There'll be a brief survey at the end. Uh, please fill it out to help us provide you with the information you need. There are quite a few thank yous, awesome, all kinds of notes coming in real quickly. And will this recording be available later? Yes, it will. On our website, uh, there will be a recording. It'll be on our homepage. There's a little blue button that says view our last webinar. And it will be there hopefully by this afternoon. I'll get it edited and up. Again, Dr. Gallup, thank you so much. And there are still quite a few thank yous coming in. You're most <laughs> so, welcome. Thank uh, you for inviting me. It's been my pleasure. All right. Thank you. Everybody have a wonderful afternoon or evening, depending on where you are, and a wonderful weekend. Thank you very much. Take care. You too. Thanks.